Okay, so again, I was already introduced, but just in case you're just jumping in from another uh, and you weren't in the first session, I'm Dr. Michelle Thompson. I'm actually board certified in lifestyle, integrative and family medicine and chair of medicine for UPMC Horizon. And today we're going to talk about physician wellness and sound therapy. The objective is to acknowledge burnout as a current problem in the healthcare system and education. Identify the internal and external factors associated with this burnout. Identify possible interventions to prevent it and to treat it from an individual perspective. Identify practical ways to increase resilience and emotional intelligence as protective factors against burnout and tools to increase physician well-being. So we're going to watch a quick little few minute video. Not sure how many of you have seen this, but three minutes. Hi, Pamela. We just had another doctor jump and commit suicide from Mount Sinai. This keeps happening, and they're just covering it up. If we had this number of patients jumping from hospital rooftops, there would be an investigation. Why are we not taking this seriously when these are doctors and medical students? We're going to be looking at two things, the posture of the wall. Everybody understands that, that medical school is very demanding. Those demands have a profoundly toxic effect. Doctors have felt that they need to start running faster, seeing more and more patients. All of this pressure happens, and there's no margin for error. You take care of people who die. It's like you erodes your spirit. Workload, isolation, sleep deprivation. It is a time bomb. It really is almost like tunnel vision. The only way that I logically was thinking at that time was it's to I end it all. To end it all. Break down in my room every night. I never wanted to die. I, I just wanted to stop suffering. People believe in you because you are perfect. Death sometimes feels like a, a safer option than having that mask uncovered. The medical profession has launched a campaign to reduce the high level of suicide among doctors. This qualifies, in my view, as a pandemic. The biggest risk is patient safety. Medical errors are now the third largest cause of death behind heart disease and cancer. If you have somebody that is not functional, either mentally or physically, then you can't have good quality care. I've seen a resident be in a surgery, falls asleep standing up. So my first question is, how come this story is not on the front pages of the papers every single day? If a third of them are suffering from clinical depression, that should be known, that yeah. should be exposed. Our son Kevin was a fourth year medical student who took his life on April 23rd, 2015. I realize this has been a problem for decades and nothing's been done about it. We are not ashamed. And we're going to do anything we can to keep others from having to go through this, because I'm going to tell you, it's hard. Cultures and institutions don't change because we ask them to change. They change when they're forced to change. I've read the petition, and we're already doing what they're asking. I think if you were to really take on physician suicide with the seriousness that it needs to be investigated, it would take our entire medical profession down to its knees, and we would have to rebuild from, from the bottom up. Everybody take a deep breath. And that's why we're in this space today talking about physician wellness. It's actually very important. One physician commits suicide every day in the US. Have you felt burned out from practicing medicine at any point during your career? 91% of people said yes. And do you feel burned out right now? 71% of people said yes. Next slide, please. Residents and medical students, one third of medical students suffer from depression. 5.8% have considered suicide. 29 to 42% of residents were depressed. This rate is four times higher than that of the general population. 76% felt burnt out. Depersonalization, lack of personal accomplishment, emotional exhaustion are all looking at burnout. 
external factors that contribute to burnout, excessive workload, difficult work environment, decreased control, decreased sense of community, perception of inequity, value conflict, challenging clinical situations. Next slide, please. Internal factors that contribute to burnout, work-life integration, loss of meaning to work, lack of stress management skills, lack of coping skills, introversion, neuroticism, family stress, being unmarried, and being in the first year of residency. So how has COVID pandemic impacted your feelings of burnout? It's made people more burned out, 65%. 26% said it hasn't affected them and 9% said it reduced their feelings of burnout. Doctors have personal problems like everyone else. Doctors develop on the job PTSD. Patients' deaths hurt doctors a lot. Even when there's no medical errors, doctors may never forgive themselves for losing a patient. Suicide is the ultimate self-punishment for the perfectionist. Bullying, hazing, sleep deprivation also increases the suicide risk. Medical training is rampant with human rights violations, illegal in other industries. Blaming doctors increases suicide. Doctors fear, fear the lack of confidentiality if they seek mental health care. So can you answer yes to any or all of these questions? Are you super excited to go to work on Monday morning? Are you having so much fun you'd work for free? Do you hope you never have to retire? If you can't answer yes to these questions, why not? When will you? And what is your plan of action this year to improve your career? What's the solution? Well, as it said, organization and institutional approaches, and we're working on that. Both are needed, uh, individual efforts are also needed, and both are needed to ensure total well being. Next slide. We need to start, though, with ourselves and create our own prescription for wellness. We have to take care of ourselves first. Doctors are human. We require emotional support to thrive in medicine. The culture of medical education has too often pitted us against one another in an environment which your success depends on crushing your competition. What if we interacted at, with each other as human beings first? I invite you to embrace each other as brothers and sisters in medicine. So coping mechanisms of some physicians, isolating themselves, exercise, talking with family and friends, sleep, eating junk food, listening to music, drinking alcohol, binge eating, smoking cigarettes, using prescription drugs, dr marijuana, and 12% said other or none of the above was 3%. And that was in uh, Medscape. Spending enough time in your personal health or wellness, only 50% responded that sometimes or rarely. 50% are trying to lose weight and 50% have one or more drinks per week, again, out of Medscape. So what is resiliency? It's the capacity of an individual to respond to stress in a healthy, adaptive way, such that the personal goals are achieved at minimal psychological and physical costs. Resiliency is the ability to recover quickly from a situation where things do not go as planned. Resiliency isn't a single skill, it's a variety of skills and coping mechanisms. It is accepting that things do not always go your way, learning from your mistakes, maintaining a positive attitude, and exhibiting mental toughness and grit. Attributes of resilience, empathy, effective communication and interpersonal skills, stress hardiness, learning from successes and failures, personal values, and strong problem solving and decision making skills, optimism. So optimism, positive emotions and healthy behaviors. Again, what we talked about in the last talk on lifestyle medicine, nutrition, exercise, tobacco, and avoidance of alcohol and tobacco, um, stress management, sleep, and healthy relationships. There's actually a reciprocal reinforcing relationship between positive emotions and healthy lifestyle. Physi physical activity increases positive emotions, but at the same time increases um, psychological well-being um, is also associated with physical activity. Fruit and vegetable consumption makes people feel more calm. There's actually a handout for um, foods that support brain health and um, a new field called nutritional psychiatry that I've uh, studied mind, mood, and food under. Sleep, low amounts of sleep are associated with more stress, anger, and sadness, and stress and anxiety interfere with sleep. You all know that the components of healthy lifestyle are physical activity, the whole food plant-based diet, adequate sleep, avoiding the substance abuse, stress management, and emotional relationships. Knowing these underlying six pillars of the healthy lifestyle is really a sense of positivity. So 
How can we be more optimistic? Optimism can be learned by positive psychological interventions, gratitude, character strengths, positive goal setting, optimistic thinking, savoring, mindfulness, acts of kindness, um, forgiveness, meaningful activities, visualizing the best possible self, and cultivating sacred moments, moments of awe that we talked about. This was actually seen in the journal, um, this review article that showed efficacy of multi-component positive psychology interventions, a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials showed small but significant effect on psychological and subjective well-being from positive psychological interventions. Physiological improvements associated with these positive psychological benefits, greater sense of meaning, correlates with fewer strokes, myocardial infarction, fewer urgent care visits, increased healthy behavior, better heart rate variability, and better physiological indices, such as lower body ma mass index, weight to hip ratio, um, lower lipids, lower A1C, fasting sugars, and insulin resistance. Those who actually practice gratitude, improved outlook, self-efficacy, and adherence show better heart rate variability, inflammatory markers, and heart disease. Increasing mindfulness is associated with lower pain, anxiety, depression, hostility, somatic fun focus, and stress, and increased energy, enthusiasm, relaxation, healthy habits, immune function, cognitive capacity, neuroplasticity, so self-regulation, and social connection. So again, cultivating awe, looking around, finding a moment of awe, setting an alarm on your phone, you know, just taking a look around you and seeing something that is positive. So this feeling of being in the present of something vast and greater than yourself that exceeds current knowledge structure. Awe is self-expansive emotion where the boundaries of a separate self are transcended. It is possible to experience this expansive feeling of awe many times throughout the day. And that's what we call microdosing mindfulness. So why is mindfulness important for physicians? Evidence-based evidence research shows that enhanced attention, working memory and cognitive control, emotional regulation and well-being, decreasing the stress biomarkers, self-compassion and patient satisfaction. Mindfulness in clinical practice as physicians for self-care. Physicians with regular mindfulness practices enjoy reduced stress response, uh, preservation, physical illness, depression, anxiety and burnout. Those physicians also experience improvements in perceived empathy, patient adherence, patient outcomes, and reduced medical errors. So being mindful when you have a 24 hour shift, you can do this in three minutes when you open a chart, recognizing <laughs> knowledge your current thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations, bringing your attention to the sensations of your breath in the body, slowly expanding this awareness into your body as a whole. You can just list three things you're grateful for when your alarm goes off on your phone. When you're going to see your next patient, just focusing your feet on the floor each time your mind starts to wander, go back to your feet on the floor. Hand washing mantra. This is something that I do and I do it out loud with my patients. I say when I'm washing my hands, may we all be calm, may we all be healthy, may we all be safe, may we all be happy, and may we all live with ease. So mindfulness is a mindset, it's not an activity. I'm okay, gonna, here I'm going to have a couple of words. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take over. This is something that she's done a research study on. So go ahead, Dr. Sierra. Thank you. So emotional intelligence has really like made an impact on my personal life and my professional life. So that gave me the motivation to do a review article that I recently published. And from it, I can conclude that when we are mindful on a daily setting, it's easier to be emotional intelligent. And we want to bring the emotional intelligent piece here because it's a key component of resiliency. So what is emotional intelligence? It's a couple of, or a group of, of abilities that compose two of them are going to be focused on how we behave with ourselves. And the other two are, uh, or involve how we behave with others. But the first one, and in my opinion, the most important one is self-awareness. So if I am mindful, it's, go it's going to be easier to be more self-aware. And what is be self-aware? It's to be able to understand the causes and the consequences of my emotions and my feelings. And in that sense, I will have the capacity to recognize what are my strengths, but also what are my challenges? What is triggering me? 
And most importantly, self-awareness helps me to identify what I want to change about myself. Once I am self-aware, I can more easily turn into being able to regulate my, my emotions, and that is what we call self-management. This is being able to recognize what is triggering me and gives me the capacity to remain calm when I'm dealing with difficult emotions so I can uh, use these difficult emotions to have in a constructive way and not in a destructive way when I'm making difficult decisions. The other two uh, are involving uh, others. The first one is social awareness and it's the capacity that I have to tune into others' emotions, recognize what they need, what they are feeling and what their needs are. Uh, and the last one that uh, comes from, from the other three, I mean, they are all like building upon the one that comes before is social management. And social management is just being able to relate to others in an assertive way so that my communication is effective and allows me to have influence on others. So emotional intelligence, as I was saying, is a crucial element on resilience. And resilience is what we need to build in ourselves as physicians in order to prevent burnout and to cope uh, easier with the difficult uh, emotions and situations that we have on a daily basis. So here I posted two uh, studies. One is that uh, emotional intelligence protects the healthcare providers against burnout and increases well-being. And well, I think that if I am self-aware, it's uh, I will know myself better and that will uh, signify that I am more self-confident. I will be more flexible when I am facing change. I will be more optimistic and I, am will, and I will be more empathetic. So all that, as we saw previously that Dr. Michelle was saying, all those components make me a resilient person. The other uh, study is that uh, there is a systematic review and they propose that emotional intelligence is a protective factor and that relates to patient safety and satisfaction. And they have three hypotheses that they propose to explain this. The first one is that um, taking into account that emotions can impact the clinical judgment. The first reason is because um, the presence or absence of empathy towards my patient can really have an influence on the therapeutic decisions that I'm making. The second one is that if I am working in an adverse work environment, I have conflict with my colleagues that can elicit feelings or emotions in an individual and collective basis that will impact my clinical and my collective judgment. And the third one is that as a provider, I have previous similar experiences as the one that I'm facing with patients today. So that emotional response that I have towards that previous experience can really influence the perception of the amount and the type of information that I consider important to make my clinical judgment. So if I am emotionally intelligent, if I am more self-aware, I am less likely to fall into one of these three conditions that are related to patient safety. Uh, and lastly, but not less important, is that when I am emotional intelligent, I am less likely to uh, cope with one of these um, not so healthy uh, coping mechanisms that we saw previously on the slides as um, binge eating or self-isolation. So we know that emotional intelligence can be cultivated. We can learn to be more emotional intelligence intelligent. We are not just like born with emotional intelligence and that's it. So I bring here a couple of questions that we can ask ourselves on a daily basis to increase our emotional intelligence. The first one is related to self-awareness. So it's very important here to ask myself if I am really aware of my emotions and more importantly, if I am able to name it. It's not just the feeling of being overwhelmed and to just feel like I'm having a hard time. It's like really making an effort to label the emotions because uh, MRI studies have shown that when I label the emotions, the activity in my amygdala decreases and the intensity of the emotion as, as well decreases. Uh, other uh, questions are, am I really listening um, to others to have uh, to understand what they are saying? Or am I just like, uh, listening to have a response. 
other question is how am I talking to myself? So many times we just talk to ourselves like we were our worst enemy. So we we should really like make an effort to be more compassionate and pay attention on how are we talking to ourselves. And lastly, that this is like a, a hard one for us is like really tuning into my body and saying, hey, are my basic needs uh, fulfilled? Am I hungry? Have I rested enough? Uh, what do I need in this moment? These are related to self-awareness. Now we can turn into self-management and, and that is like, do I know what, is my, what are my triggers? What are my challenges? Do I know what is on my zone of control? Am I making really enough time to take care of myself? Do I have a support network and am I allowing myself to rely on them? Am I being able to ask for help? And lastly, what brings meaning and uh, purpose to my life? Then when I am relating to others, it's important to ask myself, as I said before, am I just listening to respond or am I listening to really understand the other person? Can I identify the emotions on others accurately? I mean, do I really have the capacity to see what other my colleagues are feeling or what their needs are? And this one is like on a daily basis, take a look at my team and really see, am I, is there someone whose work have I, I have not recognized and be grateful for? The last one is uh, into relationship management. And this, as leaders and as physicians, we need to ask ourselves, am I bringing patients to my work environment? Am I really supposing that or assuming that others are making their best effort to be here working with me? Am I being clear and honest with my information and my communications? Am I being frequent with them? And am I open to feedback? And for, to finish, am I going slow at key moments? And this includes really taking a pause to say thank you to others. That's it that I wanted to share. Thank you, Dr. Sierra. So, in, uh, in, um, because of time, we're gonna whip through some of these slides actually, and then go right to the sound therapy so that you have an experience, but you will have these links so that you can reference them back and you will have all of these slides available to you. So well-being is a skill that can be learned. Happiness and well-being are not the same. You can visit Dr. R uh, Richard Davidson. He has um, talks about his well-being being composed of four different pillars, awareness, connection, insight, and the purpose in life. Next slide, please. So working on your well-being, positive outlook, remembering why you're doing what you're doing, training your attention, and caring for others. Next slide, please. Healthy life schedules hack, more rest, eating healthy, exercise. Next slide. Reducing stress, trying some of these different modalities that we're going to do today. You will not like all of them, but just try some of them. Next slide, please. Setting boundaries, leaving your work at work. When you come home, come all the way home when you can, when you're not on call. Take off your healing cap unless you're, you need to take it on, leave it on because you're on call. For me, I pretend like it's my um, Mr. Rogers jacket. I take off my white coat until I have to put it back on. Don't let your identity be completely wrapped up in your occupation and learning to be present. Just be a human being, not a human doing. With that, we're gonna play the little trailer again because we didn't, I don't know if everybody was on break. And then we're gonna roll into the sound therapy. Sound can evoke emotions, memories, or a state of being. Um, and it's a vehicle for me for uh, actions and to get from one state of mind maybe to another. Uh, sound for me is most related to music. I think all sounds can be a music rhythm to it in a way. Uh, sound to me, I guess, is kind of, you know, everywhere. I don't know, energy waves. Life presents challenges. There's ups, there's downs, but what I noticed is sound was always there for me. How does sound affect our brain and our emotion and our thoughts and our cognition? Because the world of sound is, is endless. If you made medication to a cell, to your own sound, silent sound, that's my power working. 
using meditation, taking a time out and getting hyper focused on something, a sound and the vibration are very, very um, helpful and beneficial to focusing us into a state of relaxation. Certain sounds are more pleasant than others, but do they actually have an impact on our well-being? Somebody did a study where they went into an office building and found that the hum coming off this computer is this note, and the hum coming off this light is this other note. All day you have this discordant note playing in your background. I was going nuts, you know, watching, you know, doing Facebook and Googling and watching all the news and all the events that are happening. And I was getting uneasy and it was like, well, what's going on? Everything has vibration, whether it's the cells in our body to a plant, to an animal, to a thought, to a color. You create an energetic resonance that really can couple with the energy of other people. When we utilize sound therapy and especially, you know, employing it as training wheels to help us, it really helps us to get to a spot that we couldn't otherwise get to. And I thought, you know, I really needed this. My patients need this. The world needs this. We can transform ourselves and in turn help transform society. Now we are going to play a video Hi, my name is that contains uh, Christina Grosick. She's an expert in sound therapy and she kindly made a video explaining all the science and all that is behind sound therapy for health, especially for this family medicine uh, ground round. So we are going to, to see her now and to see the, the, the video. My name is Christina Grozik, and you just finished watching a trailer for a documentary that a group of us just wrapped up a few weeks ago. So the project's called Going Ohm, and it was a two and a half year journey on the exploration of sound and silence and what those are, why they're important, and how they could potentially impact our well-being. So thank you for taking the time to watch the trailer. We are working on distribution for the film. We don't have it quite yet. Like I said, we just finished the film itself. So now it's the distribution side of things. So it is a work in progress. We're literally working on it as we're speaking. So, but I have a lot of people ask why, why that topic? Why take that amount of time to dedicate to that topic? It's interesting. So sound has impacted my life in such a way that it has literally changed my life. I've seen it change my clients' lives, right? So why not do it? My background, just so you know, is doing logistical work and troubleshooting and basically putting out fires for film production, TV production, and then special events. So, you know, it's the same skill set. It's just different lingo between the two. It's planning backup plans from A to Z. It's looking forward, it's scheduling, it's looking in the past to see what worked, what didn't work, how we can improve it moving forward. So it's multitasking. It's constantly thinking and planning, right? Gauging what's coming, looking back and saying, oh, that didn't work, let's move forward, right? So it's always, always, always moving, right? And doing. So that is my first career. Now, while I was doing that along the path, I decided to explore wellness. So I spent maybe about 15 years studying different practices, different modalities, getting certifications, you know, things like polarity therapy, yoga teacher training, Reiki, integrated health coaching, vibrational sound therapy, and the sound part is what always, always like grounded and rooted my foundation in my work. So I integrate all my modalities, but the sound part is what always it's based on, right? So seeing again, the way it's changed my life and my client's life. And then when I went to Thailand to work with elephants and singing bowls, I saw that they were able to perform procedures 
like eye procedures, nail procedures, tusk procedures on these elephants without using any kind of IV or any kind of chemical to induce a state of relaxation. They used singing bowls. So some people call these Tibetan singing bowls, some people call them Himalayan singing bowls. We'll say singing bowls, but they use the singing bowls to induce a state of relaxation with these elephants so they could perform those procedures. And as I sat there and watched this, and I, was, I spent days there and watching how every single person assigned to an elephant carried a singing bowl and how they utilize them in their everyday life and practices, that wow, if a singing bowl can have an impact and relax an animal of that size, then what could it do to us? And what could sound in general do to us? And what about silence, right? So they all go hand in hand. So we went on this journey of going home. So, you know, I want to take a moment to just talk about sound and how it impacts your life. So sound, we'll talk pre-COVID, right? Or at an era, pre-COVID. If you went to a sporting event, Imagine that sporting event without the cheering, without the clapping, without the roar of the announcer saying, are you ready to rumble or whatever it is, right? Clap, do whatever. Or maybe the drummer at a game, getting the crowd riled up, enthusiasm building, excitement building, cheers and roars are building, and that's the sporting event. Now imagine sitting there in silence just watching the sporting event. No clapping, no cheering, no sounds or head getting the excitement built up. Very different experience. And what about concerts? Pre-COVID, we would go to these arenas. We would pay all kinds of money on a concert ticket, right? To go to a place that is jam-packed, you're standing almost shoulder to shoulder with the person next to you. It's hot because there's so many people in there. You're stuffing your stuff in the seat in front of you or behind you right? And we're paying money to have this experience, but why? Well, is it because of the way that the sound and the music makes us feel? Maybe it's the same reason that 43 years after the death of Elvis Presley, that people from all over the world, like 600,000 people pre-COVID, would come and visit Graceland every year just to go through the house where someone that performed music lived. Or the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. In 2019, they had over half a million visitors from all over the place. Is it because someone really wanted to see the design of that t-shirt or see that signature or see a guitar that someone used? Or is it because of the way that those people and the items in that museum are connected with the people that created these sounds that really moved and impacted their lives? And now apps on our phones are becoming more popular, right? People are seeking meditation. So the app Headspace meditation app has over, uh, what is it? It's like 35 million users in 190 countries. So, you know, people are seeking out sounds for wellness and we've used them throughout the ages. We've used them in weddings, at funerals, at ceremonies, right? Sound has been a part of our life. It is a part of our life. We are sound. Everything is vibration. So if you are anything like me, you know, I, I look and I'm like, oh, you know, how can I use this for wellness? How can I improve wellness in my being? Because we're so busy as humans doing, human doing, the multitasker, the events coordinator, the logistics coordinator, right? The doing, 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 going, 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 that we don't often take the time to just be, just allow ourselves to human being, right? So recently the New York Times published an article where it said that the World Health Organization has now listed noise pollution as an increasing threat to human health. So if sound can be used to potentially harm us, then why can't it be used to potentially help us? Going back 
to human doing, right? We are in a society where we don't have a lot of downtime, right? Our sympathetic nervous system is on overdrive. It's creating stress. When we're creating stress, then we're creating a slew of potential issues that can arise out of stress. High blood pressure, heart disease, anxiety, sleep disorders, the list goes on and on and on as to the relation to stress and potential health issues. So how can we use sound to calm the mind? Well, I'll tell you, if you are anything like I am, back in the day when I started this wellness journey, I would have people say, well, do you meditate? You need to meditate. Why aren't you meditating? You just sit there. You sit there for a half hour. You just breathe and you don't think. So I would try this and I would try it and get so frustrated because as soon as I would sit down and, hmm, I would start thinking and then I'm thinking about not thinking and then I'm telling myself stop thinking but then that's a thought right and it was this whole thing that was happening where I couldn't quiet the mind but I'll tell you what happened at least for me is I found a singing bowl and I would play the singing bowl not knowing anything about singing bowls except for I really enjoyed the sound of it and I found it relaxing so the singing bowl, when I would play it, I was so calm after. It helped me sleep better at night. And I didn't realize it until weeks later that the reason I was so calm after I would play the singing bowl is because I wasn't thinking. It suspended thought for me. So all of these people that had told me, you know, you need to meditate, you need to meditate, you need to calm the mind, stop thinking. I couldn't get to that state in the way that they told me. So everyone's a bio-individual, everyone works differently, different methods work for different people. For me, the singing bowl is what got me to that state in that space that everyone had told me about, but I was having trouble tapping into on my own. The singing bowl naturally took me to that place. So how can we use sound, right? How can we use sound in our practice? I can tell you that through the research that we've seen in Going Home, the documentary, we've seen singing bowls really, really help calm horses and elephants. We saw vibration from plants being collected with these electrotype looking devices, and that was carried into a machine. The machine assigned a sound to it. That sound created the most beautiful music, and the guy that actually is doing that won a Grammy for his work. So it's the, the vibration, the vibration, right? It's traveling, it's impacting, it's being translated into sound. Why is there a national radio quiet zone in the US? Because it's where the Green Bank Observatory lives. So it's a radio telescope. It's about 300 feet. 300 feet in diameter. Think about that. That is huge. It's massive. And their employees are not allowed to have microwaves. There are no cell phone towers in the area, hence the National Radio Quiet Zone. And why is that? Because a microwave down the street from a neighbor could potentially interfere with the signals that are coming into this radio telescope. It's very interesting. When you think about something of that magnitude and that size, maybe getting air interference from a microwave down the road, then what is that doing to us as humans? What are those waves and that vibration potentially doing to us? It's a good question. I want to share a quote with you. Each celestial body, in fact, each and every atom, produces a particular sound on account of its movement, its rhythm, or vibration. All of these sounds and vibrations form a universal harmony in which each element, while having its own function and character, contributes to the whole. This is Pythagoras. So we are not talking about new things. We are talking about ancient techniques that we are being reintroduced to. We are relearning them and we're relearning our relationship with sound and vibration. So a review of 
400 published scientific articles on music as medicine, found strong evidence that music has mental and physical health benefits in improving mood and reducing stress. That is from a recent article in Psychology Today. And then from the Colorado State University's Center of Biomedical Research in Music, they say that rhythmic cues can help retrain the brain after a stroke or other neurological impairment. Why are we seeing so many drum circles popping up? Why are people getting into drumming? Because it finds presence for us. We stop the mental chatter, the mental noise, and we can just be in that moment, right? It entrains our brain in a different way. So sound therapy, so many different approaches to it, so many different techniques. Every practitioner has their own style. I have studied with different practitioners all over the place. I've gone through different certification programs for it. And I will tell you that everyone approaches it a little differently, right? It's like we are bio-individuals, so are practitioners. They come up with their own system of doing things. So you can incorporate things like crystal bowls. You can incorporate chimes, gongs, rain sticks, drums, hand drums, singing bowls. There's so many different ways that you can do it. But the most important thing is that the participant comes and just finds a relaxed position, maybe closes the eyes or softens them, and they just relax. Because some of the benefits that have been affiliated with sound therapy are things like reducing tension and anger, reducing fatigue, reducing anxiety, depression. And then, you know, lowering blood uh, pressure has been attributed to sound healing as well. Uh, reduced stress and muscle stiffness, improved mental focus and clarity. Uh, aiding in digestion and promoting better sleep. So again, so many different approaches, but the benefits that have been linked to this modality are quite impressive. So I could sit here and tell you more about what it's like, or I could show you and I would rather do that. So we're going to come into a comfortable position, whether it's seated or it's laying down, if that's something that you're able to do. If you have earbuds, those are always super helpful. Um, and we are going to either close our eyes or soften our gaze. We'll take a deep breath in through the nose, if that's in your practice. You're going to expand the chest and the belly with your breath. Go ahead and release. Drop the belly, drop the chest, breathe out. Relax. Deep breath in, expansion. We are creating space in the chest and the belly. Imagine the breath flowing throughout your system. Go ahead and release. Drop the belly, drop the chest, let go of anything that maybe is in your system that's not serving you. Take a breath in and release. And you'll know this very, very many sound session is over when you hear the sound of the ting shows.
very many sound meditation session has concluded. If you are interested in learning more about these sound meditation sessions, you can contact me. Um, we just launched a website this past week. It's called Going Ohm Collective. Um, got different workshops on there. You can book a session. There's links to pre-recorded sound meditation sessions. And again, it's Going Ohm, O-M, Ohm Collective. Dot com. I'm Christina Grozik. Thank you again for allowing me to be part of this day and part of your journey and travel light. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. That was wonderful. And if you have any questions for her, definitely put them in the chat. We are going to, we're a little bit over time, but we're going to make sure that we make up, um, we make up some time in the day so we can give you all the experiences that we want to. Next slide, please. So, um, Maria and Calvin Wagner are part of the Center for Sound Therapy in Boardman, Ohio, and also part of the film, Going Ohm, that, and that's where I met Christina, was at the Center for Sound Therapy in Boardman, Ohio. They also did a sound therapy journey for you on boosting immunity. I invite you to go to their YouTube link that they gave you here, and you can actually uh, put on headphones and do a sound therapy journey with them. They are also listed on my website and I do plan to put Christina on my website as well so that you can link up with either of them. Um, there's definitely free things on online that you can get for this as a tool. Uh, somebody was asking me about benefits and um, sleep, you know, insomnia. This is great to do at bedtime, just warming the room, putting on, you know, um, like, uh, you know, warming the room a little bit, putting some essential oils in your diffuser and starting to take deep breaths, doing that soft belly breathing that we've already done today. Um, and we also, the, these pictures are actually taken at Cleveland Clinic. We were part of their sound therapy uh, experience for um, the Integrative and Lifestyle Medicine Center at the Cleveland Clinic. Next slide, please. Lots of literature here. I'm not gonna go over all of it. Christina talked about some of it, but I just want you to have it. It will be in your handout so you can look back and see the science behind sound therapy. Next slide, please. Um, and again, the summary is, is all there. I'm not gonna go over that again. Next slide. Uh, this is so important. I do not wanna forget actually to share with you, there is a book that came out called Promoting Resilience and well Wellness Among Physician Residents. My goal, actually, I'm working with the, um, the publisher. I know the, one of the authors of the book, and it, they're through the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Uh, Dr. Melissa Kerr, who's going to be speaking to you next, actually pointed this book out to me. I read the book, and a lot of the slides from today come from there, uh, some of the information that we learned about in that book, the, some of the recent studies, but I'm hoping to get some of these copies for our residency program. So more to come on that, but definitely know that this book is out there for you. Resources, mind-body stress reduction training at UPMC is also uh, available to you. Again, send me an email if you're interested in small mind-body skills groups for physicians only, or if you're interested in more sound therapy experiences, whether live or online. Next slide, please. That said, we have one call. recording. So we're going to stop the recording.